Good morning, Element Church Online. Thank you for joining us to worship today. If you will just sing with us. The greatest day in history. Death has beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. He's alive. Your eyes on this one truth, God's man. 
to take hold of courage. Sing why are you heavens? Let the praise go up as the walls go down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure heart, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. Swing wide, all you heaven. Let the praise go up as the walls come down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All the children, clean hands, pure heart, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. 
isn't it awesome to know that we always have a friend in Jesus?
worship for you, Lord. I want to pray that everyone that's listening, God, just that we can just find peace and rest in your word. Lord, thank you for giving us these opportunities to even through the chaos that's going on in the world, we can still meet and worship you, Father. You give us those opportunities. I just want to pray that as we listen to what Neil has to say this morning or whoever's preaching, that you'll just speak through them, that there'll be a mouthpiece for you, God. Thank you so much for all that you do for us. In your name I pray. Amen. Element Church, thank you so much for joining with us again for this Pray While You Stay online church service. Uh, we miss you so much, and we are looking forward to the day that we can finally get back together in this room and pray and sing and learn together uh, and just be with each other as the church. But until then, we are taking great joy in serving you in this new, uh, somewhat exciting way here online, and we hope that you are having uh, an okay time in this crazy season. Uh, getting through uh, whatever it is uh, that life is bringing you at this moment, but trusting alone in God uh, to bring you through it and know that we are praying for you and with you every single day as we pray while we stay. And so uh, while there is not a ton going on necessarily in the life of Element here on campus, there is a lot going on in the body of Christ all over Rutherford County as we pray while we stay. We want to continue to encourage you to sign up for a 15-minute time slot for our Pray While You Stay uh, prayer calendar. Our goal is to have all 24 hours uh, being actively prayed over in each given day. Uh, and that can happen with people outside of Element Church. And so we encourage you, if you're on social media, share our Pray While You Stay posts so that your friends and family all over the world can sign up for these slots and the body of Christ can be praying together for each other uh, during this difficult time. Uh, Please be continuing to look at our social media and in your email for updates about what's going on in the life of Element. Be on the lookout in social media and email for updates about how we're going to be celebrating Easter in a few weeks as our Easter egg drop at McNair Stadium has been canceled, unfortunately. But we still want to celebrate Easter with you and celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, in the midst of this chaos. And so please be on the lookout for updates with that. Um, also, something new and exciting, uh, later tonight at 6 p.m., being streamed live from the Element Church Facebook page, our Connect Group coordinators, Butch and Kim Hobson, are going to be hosting a live Connect Group that they would love for you to be a part of. So even if you are not in a Connect Group typically, but would like to join in on this connect group, please go to the Element Facebook page at 6 p.m. and they will be there hosting a live stream that you will actually be able to interact with them, interact with the Bible study that is based off of the sermon that you're hearing this morning. And so be on the lookout for that. And that's gonna happen each week uh, during this time of us being separated. We do want to encourage you to continue giving. Your generosity has astounded us in this season where it would be so easy to forget about giving. Uh, Element has continually gave, and so we want to encourage you to continue doing that as we love on our community and minister our community in new creative alternative ways. And so uh, you can send check to 1071 South Broadway. That's our address here at the church. You can drop a check in our secure mailbox at the back door of our office. Um, you can give online at elementc3.com at the giving page, or you can text to give right now as you're watching this stream. You can text 84321 with the amount that you'd like to give. 
And if you've never used text to give uh, you'll get a link which will enable you to sign up for this service. Now, if you're having trouble signing up, please reach out to us at office at elementc3.com or message us on Facebook and we will do everything we can to help you set that up. Uh, thank you for continuing to be generous and cheerful givers in this season. I want to encourage you once again to utilize this season to not choose fear over faith. I know that everybody's struggling. I know that everybody's confused. But as one of your pastors, I want to encourage you to use this time to focus on prayer and connecting with our God who loves us and wants what is good for us. And so please use this season to join with us in pray in prayer as we pray while we stay. And so we want to do that right now as we continue worshiping uh, here in this 21st century way, here online, but together. And so let's pray together as if we were all in this room. And let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you. We thank you that you are bigger than we think that you are. Lord, that you know exactly what is going on. You know exactly how this is all going to go. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ and through the victory that we have in his blood and in the resurrection uh, that we see him uh, deliver this community from this sickness. Lord, protect this community, this church, this people uh, from sickness and harm. Lord, and allow them, fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can be your light in the darkness in this community, that the community around us will turn to the church for its hope, that we will direct the community to the source of our hope, which is you. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, show us your glory. Show us your glory in the midst of this season. Allow us to minister in the midst, the midst of this chaos, this confusion this fear, and allow us to have faith in you over fear of what's going on in the world. So, Father, anoint this time. Fill all of us, even in, from our phones and in our computer screens. Fill us with the Holy Spirit that we could worship and minister together, even though we might be apart physically. So, Father, we give you all these things. We give you the offering this morning and this week that it would be for your glory and not ours. And we pray that we would make you more famous this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, good morning Element Church. I am uh, glad to be sharing with you guys this morning uh, from God's Word. We are uh, definitely living in the midst of some uncommon times. Nothing uh, makes this more apparent than the fact that I am speaking to you this morning from an empty church building. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm excited as you guys are gathered with uh, family in your homes and tuning in this morning uh, to, the, to the worship, the great time of worship, celebrating the name of Jesus and uh, the opportunity for us to open the word together this morning and allow the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do and illuminate that word and to teach us from his word. And uh, as I was uh, preparing for this service, there's a story that uh, comes out of the Old Testament, 1 Kings chapter 17. You can go ahead and uh, take your copy of God's word and turn there, be preparing uh, for us to read through this story. It's the story of the prophet uh, Elijah, who uh, was living himself in a very uncommon time. And I want to talk about that with you uh, in our time together this morning. But before we do, I wanted to share a story, uh, an uncommon story that just happened to me literally uh, within the last week. I, uh, in the midst of all of this uh, pandemic, this uh, coronavirus going on in our midst, um, I uh, decided just to go out to my RV, had some uh, DIY projects going on, I decided to just kind of go out there one evening and spend some time working on some projects, and I had the uh, news on and was listening out there just to some of the reports, as many of you have been doing over the last couple of weeks, 
of exactly what this virus has been doing uh, throughout our country and, uh, and throughout the globe. And as I was out there, I, had, uh, I was painting a few little vent covers, had them outside. I was back up on the RV just kind of letting them dry. And I, I heard the sound of, uh, of rain starting to pitter-patter on the roof of the RV. So I, I rushed outside to uh, get these uh, freshly painted vent covers and bring them back inside so that they could finish drying and not be ruined by the rain. And as I came back in, I was, I was placing the vents and spacing them out, putting them on some cardboard on the table. And it was just about, you know, 8.15, 8.20 at night, just starting to get dark. And as I was doing this, out of the corner of my eye, I saw something run into the RV. I'd left the door open. And as I turned and looked, staring at me uh, was a raccoon. This raccoon had uh, decided it was just going to see what was going on in the RV. So it, it ran up. Of course, it startled me. And I, so I jumped back, and this raccoon just kind of looks at me. And it, it's got this, I don't know what raccoons, uh, how they are supposed to look at you when they're looking at you. But this raccoon was definitely looking at me in a very weird way. And uh, I remember a, a story one time I heard a guy on the news who had claimed that uh, he had an encounter with Bigfoot in his backyard. And I will never forget, uh, they asked him, the news reporter asked him, what did you do? And he said, I rough talked it and it ran away. And that phrase uh, has always stuck in my mind. And I would say, that's what I did to that raccoon. I, I, I rough talked this raccoon and, uh, and yelled at it and said, get out of here, you know, and, and partly from me being startled and partly from, you know, there's something wrong with this raccoon going through my mind, but the raccoon just continued to stare at me. Uh, it did not move. It was unmoved by me yelling at it, which, um, which made things even worse. Like, I, I the, 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 fright that I was feeling of like, oh my goodness, there definitely is something wrong with this raccoon. So I reached over and I grabbed a level and I, I, I had to swat this raccoon literally off of my RV. And so I knock him out the door and I shut the door and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And literally within 30 seconds of me just sitting there thinking, Okay, I gotta call animal control. There's something this this raccoon has uh, rabies uh, or uh, COVID nineteen. What what is going on with this raccoon? My wife comes walking through the door of the RV, and so I'm like, "Get in here!" There's a crazy raccoon out there, and she's like, "I didn't see no raccoon." I was like, "Well, it's out there. Something's definitely wrong with this thing." I yelled at it, and it did not even budge. It didn't even move. And even as I was knocking it out the door with this level. It was just like it didn't want to go. Um, so uh, I told her, I was like, you stay in the RV. I'm, uh, I'm going to go out and make sure the coast is clear. Make sure this thing's not still out there. The last thing we need in the midst of this crisis is for one of us to have to make a, a trip to the ER because we've been bitten by a raccoon. So I go out with my flashlight, and um, sure enough, this raccoon is sitting right under the RV. And so I called my wife. I was like, it's here. Stay stay in the RV. And uh, so I've, I, I get a gun. I get a gun and a flashlight. And I'm, I'm still trying to, to yell at this raccoon to get it to go on because now my wife is trapped in the RV. And the raccoon is just not interested in, in leaving. And I'm, I'm thinking, I can't, I can't shoot this raccoon because it's under my RV. And so I'm literally just standing there. And uh, eventually, this raccoon starts coming at me, coming towards me from a distance. But nonetheless, he's looking right at me. He's coming towards me. So I fire two shots into the air. And again, the raccoon could care less about the fact that I have a gun and I'm shooting this gun into the air. It just keeps doing what it wants to do under this RV. So it's in the midst of this standoff 
between me and the raccoon and the RV that one of my teenage daughter's friends comes pulling into the driveway. And this is the reason why I share this story. Uh, she pulls into the driveway, and I'm standing in the driveway with a, a flashlight shining onto a raccoon that's next to the tire of my RV and a gun in my hand. And so I'm, I'm worried that she's going to be concerned about what's going on. So I motion for her to park at the top of the driveway, which she does. And then uh, she gets out of her car, and she just kind of stands there. And so in a, in a firm voice, uh, but a reassuring voice, I say to her, I say, Raven, go in the house. Go in the house. Go in the front door. And she looks at me and goes, and only the voice that a teenage girl can say it in well, hold on, I need a minute as she is rifling through her vehicle to find something. And I'm like, does she not see what's going on here? And so I say, Raven, get in the house now, thinking that now she'll get the point that something urgent is going on and that she needs to get to safety in the house. But instead, she looks at me and says, you are so rude. You are so rude. I was like, Raven, just go in the house. And later, uh, after all of this incident was over, um, I was in the house, and I was like, Raven, when have I ever, you've been over at my house a thousand times over the last several years, when have I ever raised my voice at you? She was oblivious to what was going on and what was happening, uh, but she just thought I was being rude, even though I was trying to help her get to safety. I, I can't tell you everything that went down with the raccoon, but I can tell you that my wife is safe, the RV is safe, and the raccoon uh, is in a better place. So we'll just leave it at that, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll jump into God's Word this morning. So 1 King chapter 17, beginning with verse 8, we're going to read together through the end of the chapter. The word of the Lord came to him, him is Elijah, the prophet Elijah, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water and a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be sent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends the rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she, she and, her, and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. In verse 17, after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and cause the death of my son. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged. And he laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, you have brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son. Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, 
Oh, Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah. And the life of the child came into him again. And he was revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house. And delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, God, just to open your word and to celebrate the stories of what you've done, the miraculous stories, God, of what you have done. I pray in our time together this morning that we would be reminded in the midst of our own calamity, that we would be reminded of what kind of God you are, who you are, what you're capable of. God, may the, may the truth of your word, God, may it bring rest and stability to your people. Lord, we love you. We ask these things in the strong and the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. So I want to take just a few moments, point out four things that come out of this uncommon time and this uncommon faith that we see in the life of, a, of Elijah. If you would like, feel free at home to go ahead and keep notes. And if you are, the first thing you can write down is that people with uncommon faith will be moved by the message instead of being moved by the mess. People with uncommon faith will be moved by the message instead of being moved by the mess. Look at verse 8. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to him. So if you go back and you read the first part of 1 Kings chapter 17, you'll find out that uh, Elijah is uh, God's prophet in the land of Israel. And the land of Israel is currently being rule, ruled by a very wicked king and his wife, Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, Ahab and Jezebel had disrupted the worship of Yahweh and had introduced into public life, the worship of foreign, false gods. Uh, Jezebel had led the, to the, uh, the death of many of the prophets of God, those people that would not uh, yield, uh, those people that would only worship Yahweh as the one true God and uh, had a voice in the public. She had uh, had them uh, executed, had had them killed, and Elijah has already spoken the judgment of the Lord upon the land of Israel because of Ahab and Jezebel's sin. And so they're in the midst of this drought and this famine, and God has given Elijah instruction to go to this brook, and there would be provision for him. So it's an uncommon time. It's a difficult time. Uh, the prophet Elijah is out there, he's, seclude, he's secluded, he's sequestered, he's by himself, he's having food brought to him by birds, he's drinking from this brook, and in verse 8 we find that this brook, his only source of water, has dried up. He's dried up, this could be a very bad thing for Elijah. He's out here in the middle of nowhere, there are people that uh, desire to hunt him down and kill him, and now he no longer has an active source of water, but we find in the life of this uncommon man, an uncommon faith. And it's a faith that is not moved by the mess. He sits and he waits. And verse 8 says, then, then the word of the Lord came to him. And I've been reminded during this season that often I have, uh, the then for me has been uh, the report on the 5 o'clock news. The then for me has been the conversation that I've had with others as I've been out and about. Instead, I need to wait for my then to be from the message instead of the mess. But God was training his prophet Elijah to respond to his word. The reality is that God was not surprised. He was not surprised by this brook drying up. Church, we have to learn to be a people that respond to the word of God if we desire to be effective in relaying the word of God. And we see during this uncommon time an uncommon faith in the life of Elijah as he is allowing God to teach him and to train him not to panic, 
not to panic, not to, not to get caught up in the, in the moment, not to get caught up uh, in, in the mess of the moment, but to wait, to wait for a message from on high. Have you been moved by the mess over the last few weeks? Has fear ensnared you? I would encourage you to write down Psalms chapter 91, verse 1 through 7. I think this is a key passage in Scripture for us during this time. It says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, You are my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. And I want to say to you, church, this morning that our God is faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful to, to deliver us uh, from falling into the snare. And I am thankful that he is faithful to deliver us even if we have gotten caught up in this snare of fear. That he is faithful to deliver us. Verse 4, he will cover you with his feathers under his wings. You will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the calamity that destroys at noon. Though a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, no harm will come near you. Uncommon faith will be moved by the message instead of being moved by the mess. Number two, in verse nine, uncommon faith will lead you to unreached places. Uncommon faith will lead you to unreached places. Verse 9, God says to his prophet Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. It's the significance of where God is sending Elijah is that Sidon was outside the boundaries of, of Israel. It was in a, a land that was occupied by Canaanites, uh, Canaanites who were enemies to the Israelites. The Canaanites were the very place that a lot of this idol worship had, had risen up and had made its way into the life of Israel. Israel was influenced by the worship of false gods in Sidon, uh, the Jezebel. Sidon was actually Jezebel, the queen that had married Ahab. Uh, it was her hometown. And so uh, God, in the midst of all this uh, calamity, God calls Elijah and says, I want you to go. I want you to go into this unreached place. Sidon was a, a dark place and it produced dark people. But God's word, listen, God's word will lead God's people to places where there are lost people, where there are people that are far from him, far from him. God's, God is a God who has a heart for people that are lost. And his word will lead God's people to places with lost people. Uh, a great example of this is there's a young lady. If you're a part of the Element family and uh, you are partnered with an amazing young lady named Miriam. Miriam is a college-age young lady who received a word from the Lord to leave the comfort of the United States and to go to the very place that Elijah is going to, which is now modern-day Lebanon. She, she felt the call to go there, uh, to love the people, and to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you're a part of the Element Church family, we, through our uh, 2020 missions, we partner with her. Uh, we partner with her through financial support. We partner with her through prayer. And she is an amazing young lady who has an uncommon faith that has led her to an unreached place. And I wanted to take a minute and just in the midst of this passage, in the midst of this time, just share as she has sent the body here at Element Church a thank you letter uh, just saying thank you. Thank you for your partnership with me. Uh, it's it's a it's an amazing letter. It's, it's a letter that I can promise you we will never lose in the life of Element Church. We will hang on to this and treasure this. But the thank you letter opens with a quote from a, uh, another famous missionary named William Carey that says, I will descend into the pits if you will hold the rope. I will descend into the pits 
if you will hold the rope. Miriam says, Element believers, thank you so much for your support and prayers. I am amazed and encouraged by you and your decision to be a part of my team. I am excited to pursue being faithful and abiding in what God has given me, prayer and the ministry of the word. My desire is to be faithful in my relationship with Jesus, taking the time and energy to learn Arabic well and being obedient and sharing the gospel while I'm immersed in the culture. God is already stretching and using me. You have a vital part in all of it. Thank you for holding the rope. Thank you for holding the rope. Uncommon faith is going to lead people to unreached places. I want to let you in on a little secret about this beautiful little county that we live in. This rural country live in small town friendly. Within its borders, there are dark, unreached places, pits of despair. And it's going to take some of us who are willing to descend, just as our sister Miriam is willing to move in obedience to display uncommon faith. It's going to take some of us who are willing to descend into the pits of despair here in this county. The pits, the, the streets that are ripe with addiction, generational abuse. And it's going to take others of us who are willing to hold the rope. Willing to hold the rope because uncommon faith will always lead us into unreached places. So Elijah is on his way to Sidon. But actually, he's, he's headed to a, a suburb of, of, of Sidon. It's just outside of Sidon, a little place called Zarephath. Zarephath, if you look it up, has an interesting meaning. It means smelting shop, which is a, it's a workshop for the refining and the smelting of metals. So God is sending Elijah to this little suburb of Sidon, this big city of Lebanon, the sin of, the, of the Canaanites. He's sending him there to this place, the town that is known for the metal work that it does, the refining of metal. And I, man, I was, I was reminded of two passages, one from the New Testament and the Old, of God's desire to take his people through a process of refining, of removing the the flaws and the brokenness in our life. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 7 says this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of of Jesus Christ. And then in Malachi chapter 3, I love I love the prophet Malachi as he is talking about this refining process. I love how the message records this verse. It says, "But who will be able to stand up to that coming? Who can survive his appearance? He will be like white hot fire from the smelter's furnace. He will be like the strongest lye soap at the at the laundry. He will take his place as a refiner of silver, as a cleanser of dirty clothes. He'll scrub the Levite priests clean, refine them like gold and silver until they're fit for God, fit to present offerings of righteousness. Then and only then will Judah and Jerusalem be fit and pleasing to God as they used to be in years long ago. Man, God is leading us to a place in our life of refinement. And I promise you in these in this time that you can know one thing about our God, he doesn't waste anything. He doesn't waste anything. As I was thinking about this subject of refining, I was doing a little bit of research and I read an article that was talking about the process of refining silver. It's interesting that if the refiner leaves that silver in the fire for too long and that too long can be just a matter of 20 to 30 seconds and in 20 to 30 seconds that silver can be ruined and so the question is how does he know how does he know when's the right time to pull that silver back out of the out of the fire and it's interesting it said in this article that when the refiner 
sees his reflection in the silver. He knows it's time to pull the silver out of the fire. I thought what an amazing truth for us as believers to to understand that if we find ourselves in the midst of a difficult time, that difficulty for believers is different because we have a good refiner. We have a good refiner who is simply waiting. He's simply waiting to see that fire produce his reflection in our lives. Uncommon faith will lead you to unreached places. And also, look at the last part of chapter 17, verse 9. Uncommon faith will bring unusual provision. There's been a lot of, a lot of worry, a lot of fear, a lot of concern about provision over the last few weeks we've been worried about supply chains and and thankfully we we live really in the best place in the world to live to to face such a difficult time Um, I was thinking I probably live in the only country in the world where we can go through weeks of difficulty and I gain 10 pounds Uh, but that's just the reality of how blessed we are to live in America, to live in this great nation. Uh, But believers need to understand that uncommon faith will bring unusual provision. Look at verse 9. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. In the middle of a drought and famine, God sends Elijah to the poorest of poor, a widow in a foreign land, with a child to receive provision. Uncommon faith will often bring unusual provision. Look at the the widow's response to Elijah's request for for provision. It makes him, she makes him aware of her lack. Her words are, are so practical. In verse 12, she says, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked. I only have a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. Her words are are so practical. It's our last meal. We're going to go home. I'm going to fix it. We're going to eat it. And then we're probably going to die. You know, that's going to be the end for us. She is aware of the reality of the mess that she is in. But the beauty is that God has sent his messenger. And he has a message for her. Verse 13, Elijah says to her, do not fear. Do not fear. Listen, the command, the command for the church in this day and hour to not do not fear is such an important command. And I want you to notice in verse 13 and verse 14, this command that Elijah gives her leads to a promise. Verse 13, he says, do not fear. Verse 14, he says, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. When she obeys the command, do not fear, she gets to step into the promise of supernatural provision. Man, that's key for us to understand that, man, we need to not get caught up in the mess, but get caught up in the message. To make sure that we're not uh, just solely concerned with the practical, but we are concerned with being obedient to God's commands. Do not fear. And that when we move in obedience to those commands, it's actually that obedience that allows us to step into the supernatural promise of his provision. How many times, church, how many times do we miss the miraculous because we get moved by the mess instead of moved by the message? How many times in my life, how many times even over the last couple of weeks have I missed out on the opportunity to see God do the miraculous because I was being moved by the mess, the message of 1 Kings chapter 17, the life of the prophet Elijah, this uncommon time, this uncommon man with the uncommon faith, is that we are moved by the message, not moved by the mess. We're going to close this morning with a final point that comes out of the last part of 1 Kings chapter 17. 
Uncommon faith will bring calm out of the calamity. Uncommon faith will bring calm out of the calamity. Look at verse 17. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from the arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged. And he said, and he laid him on his own bed and he cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn? Man, out of the calamity, God brings calm. Look at verse 23. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. In the Gospel of John, chapter 16, just before the calamity of Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, Jesus tells his disciples, in this world, in this world, you will have trouble. Some translations say tribulation, difficulty. But Jesus says, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Christ is calling us, the church, in the midst of uncommon times, to show uncommon faith. To be a people that bring calm in the midst of calamity because we are moved by a message and not moved by the mess. With every head bowed and every eye closed, let's pray this morning. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the promise of your word. Thank you for the command for us not to fear but to trust in you. And God, I pray that we would be a people. And God, even though uh, over the last couple of weeks, God, the church buildings have been empty, may this be a time that your church, your people are the fullest. And we are the fullest of your goodness, of your faith, of your trust, of your promises, and that we are a people that go out into the midst of the mess, and we declare the truth of your message, that you are a good God, that you are in control, that you love us, that you care for us. God, may we be a people that bring calm in the midst of your calamity. May we be a people, God, that trust not we trust not in this mess, but we trust in your message. We love you. We ask these things in the strong and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Faithfulness, you finish all he's.
uncertainty, God, that we just hold fast, God, to your love that's never failing, God, that we know that your plan is so much bigger than what we can even see, God, and that we just, God, we just learn in this time to trust you more than we ever have. God, we just love you, God, and we thank you even for hard times, God. In your name we pray, amen. 